Welcome to the Insight Meditation Community of Charlottesville, Virginia. You can find all of our program offerings and information about our Sangha at www.imeditation.org. We meet weekly on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, currently on the Zoom platform for meditation and a Dharma talk given by one of our teachers. We also meet daily at noon Eastern Time on Zoom for sitting practice. We hope you can join us. This talk is called A Grass Spider, Indra's Net and Love. And I'm offering this for a few reasons, but the biggest one is that in, in this time when there's so much fear and so much divisiveness, some people are calling this the age of heartbreak and it doesn't seem to be letting up or that it will let up anytime soon. I think it's really important to mention also that this is an age of love, always has been. And I know that doesn't sound obvious. I mean, you could say, wow, that sounds absurd. But I think that this is why I would like to give this talk and maybe throw another, introduce something else to a way of thinking about what's going on in this age and what underlies it. So I'll start with a story and that's the story of a grass spider. Uh, this summer, I spent a lot of time or a grass spider spent a lot of time in the window of my bedroom between the exterior side of the window and the screen. And that is about, you know, about three inches wide and three feet, I mean, maybe three inches wide, at uh, three feet tall. So this grass spider was there um, and she was about an inch long, striped, brown stripes on the legs. And I looked her up, her Latin name is a Gelinopsis. And apparently this is a spider that while it is poisonous to insects, isn't a problem for human beings. I noticed her in July. And she must have crawled in when I had the window in my bedroom open. Um, so the window was closed. She was there. The screens here can't be opened. And I decided I really didn't want to open the window here to let her back in my bedroom. So there she was in this window. I tried to rescue her, but uh, to put her outside. But every time I opened the window, she just darted over to the side of the window where the, um, uh, uh, there was a place where two pieces of metal overlapped and it was like her little lair, her place of safety. So I couldn't get her uh, to do that. So she was trapped right there. And I know she's a grass spider because of her web. The usual web, what we think of a spider web is beautiful kind of, what, circular or whatever, I'm sure there's a name for it, a ge geometric name for it. That's not the kind of web she, she, she spun. What she created was a funnel kind of web that is a kind of long, and, and the end of it is right where the spider's lair is. This for her was a space between the metal. But I saw when I was over at Ivy Creek walking not too long ago, and I saw a huge funnel web that a grass spider had, uh, uh, had spun. And the end of it was in a very large, to a very large hole in the tree. And I have to say, just looking at it, it was mesmerizing. You could just see an insect going into it. It was kind of, well, mesmerizing. At any rate, she, I, I had the shade on that window. So what I did was at, at nighttime, of course, I would raise it. In daytime, I lowered it, but not completely. I lowered it so that she could be partly hidden, kind of feel more protected from, so that she was about eight inches from the bottom in this web. Um, so that was our situation for several weeks this summer. Um, I think she realized that she was trapped at the beginning of the summer, that is in July when I first saw her, she spent a good deal of time in this cavity, her lair. Later on, I saw her one time against the screen and I think she realized she couldn't get out. 
And then she just sat in one spot in this web. She didn't seem to move day or night. And <clears throat> we had a few storms, some really strong rainstorms, and her web was in tatters. She still sat there, and I knew she had water because of it, but I knew she couldn't get food, and she didn't have a mate. And I thought, well, that is it. Um, I thought a sentence, eventually she, she's going to die, either of starvation, or she would die when the weather turned cold. Now, I, first of all, I'll tell you about spiders and me, and I have a kind of a creepy feeling about spiders. You know, if it's a ladybug, it's one thing. But spiders, I, I kind of gave a shudder a little bit. And although, as I said, I tried to rescue her and I used my little um, bug rescue system, insect rescue system, which I think many of you have something like it. It's just a cup and a very, well, for me, it's a very pretty postcard somebody sent me, but that was useless. So there we were. And so instead, what I began doing, I sent her blessings as she just sat and not moved day after day. Um, and I will also say, um, there were some mornings when I would say, good morning, darling. Now, she is definitely not a darling. Uh, it's about the furthest thing from a darling I can think of. But on the other hand, I will tell you that I say darling to lots of things in my environment. You know, when my computer goes in the blink, it's come on computer, darling, we can do this. Or uh, the red light, you know, is too long and I can, stop sign and so darling is in my day and it helps me so it's a meta practice kind of helps sweeten the day so she became darling as well although i wasn't didn't feel very cozy with her so i'm talking today now not about meta practice what i want to talk about is a love that is beyond the meta practice over the weeks with this spider there's just questions naturally arose like you know What's the value? Here is one little life and she is going nowhere. She may die early. She's not gonna be able to reproduce. Does her life in the face of all the cataclysm and the difficulties, the suffering in the world, the global warming, the extinction of species, what does it mean, one life? So I was asking, does it have any value? And the response that came up in me was, yes, absolutely. A spider's life, this spider's life does have value. And I knew that that value, it's not, this wasn't a belief. It wasn't a personal thing. It was just an obvious, yes, it has value. And in terms of my relation to her, we have a shared being. She and I have a shared being. We are expressions. She and I are both expressions of life. And on the feeling level, I'll say that we are expressions of love. I don't mean love of an object, a love for a person, an animal. It is just love. That's what we are expressions of. And I think we deeply know that, feel it, although we, it's so easy to forget. Another little story came up for me when I was kind of putting this talk together. And that was a story I read once by a prisoner, someone who he had been incarcerated for quite a long time. And he wrote that one day a guard entered his cell and this guard had a leaf on his shoe. And when the guard left, the leaf had fallen off and he left it in the cell. And this prisoner said he picked up that leaf and he treasured it. It was a piece of nature. And somehow it's, that story came back to me when I was thinking about the spider because it seemed to me he had something of a similar feeling about this leaf as I sensed about the spider. And I'll just say, in conclusion to this spider story, actually there was a good conclusion. Um, I recently realized that, wait a minute, I can open this screen. 
I have, most of the screens in my place do not open. But earlier this year, those new windows were installed there. And although I had never opened them, the screens did open. I did open it spider left. So the spider is somewhere outside, hopefully producing many babies or whatever. But I thought, isn't this interesting? It was such a, a lesson in mindfulness, namely the habitual <coughs> habit patterns that we form. My thought was these screens don't open. We have habitual patterns, they don't, most of them here. And it took me a while to shift and open up and recognize, wait a minute, but these screens are different. They do open, even I'd never opened them before. And it was so simple. It just lifted up and psh, out she went. So it was, oh, and then I'll just add another thing. You know, for a little while, when first she went out, I thought, gosh, I've just thought about that earlier. She wouldn't have been stuck there for weeks. And then I realized that, do I need, well, this might sound ridiculous, but do I need to feel like blame myself? Okay, this is a tiny little example, but don't we go over this in our mind with other things as well? And I decided, no, you know what? Life is messy and we can learn from, the, we do learn from the messiness of it. Something came out of it. And I, one of the things I've learned or relearned was the messiness and that how my mind was habitual and stuck in a habitual pattern. So that was one lesson or one teaching, re-teaching, re but there was more. This life with the spider and shared being, I really began to recognize deeply, if not, not for the first time, but thinking about universal shared being she was a daily reminder, this spider. Now, I recognize also that part of our shared being is connection. At the same time, we very well know while we are connected, we're also divided. We're divided by fear, we're divided by hate, suspicion, wariness. The primitive brain, part of us, it's part of us. It enables us to survive and it separates us. At the same time, what I was thinking of is how our shared being brings us together. And I think it depends on the individual, but overall, love is greater than what diminishes us and what separates us. I think we all know examples of things, the way love has brought people together, how people have risen to the occasion to save others that they love and even strangers. So thinking of altruism, and I came across a book by um, Matthew Ricard, the Tibetan monk, who in fact has written a book called Altruism. And he points out that altruism, altruism is a state where our desire for the welfare of another person is foremost. Even if our motivation hasn't clicked in yet, even if we haven't done anything, it's the motivation is foremost. This is altruism. And he tells a beautiful story that I'd like to tell you about the power of altruism, because this is impersonal love, love with without personal gain involved. So the story by Matthew Richard is about a, um, an Indian man named Sanjit Roy, and his nickname apparently is Bunker. Uh, Bunker is what I'll call him because that's what, what he was called in the book. He's an Indian from a very well-established family. He went to one of the best schools in India. When he was about 20 years old, and that was back in 1965, there was a terrible drought in Bihar, one of the poorest states in India. Bunker went there, again, 20 years old, with some of his friends. He went there simply to see, to relate to these people, this terrible tragedy that was happening there. 
And he, when he returned home a few weeks later, he told his family that he wanted to live in a village in India and to work as an unskilled laborer digging wells. Now his family was very well to do. His mother was horrified. I mean, she just couldn't imagine. And apparently the rest of the family said, hey, wait a minute, he's a young boy, a young man. He'll come back, he'll come back just in a few weeks, he'll be disillusioned. So at any rate, they let him go. Well, Bunker stayed in the villages in India for four decades. For the first six years, he dug wells, pneumatic, with pneumatic drill to bring water to Indian villages. And then he realized, wait a minute, he could do more, more things to help. And what he started to do next, his next project, he trained village women and he chose the grandmothers. And in India, the grandmothers were aged 35 to 50. He chose the grandmothers because mothers were too busy raising kids to be able to do anything extra. But the women at the age 35 to 50 who were illiterate and he taught them how to make uh, solar, solar panels. And they did. They made more than a thousand solar panels apparently for sale and for sale distribution, however it was in India and elsewhere. Now, apparently according to New Card, uh, Bunker was ignored by the World Bank. He was ignored by the local governments. They paid no attention to him. His mother stopped talking to him and his family thought that he was on an insane journey. So he was really alienated from his whole family. Still, the grandmothers worked, the Indian grandmothers, they'd supplied the solar panels. And then Bunker realized he could do more as well. And he, what he did was he began to harness the ancestral knowledge of the farmers, ways to collect rainwater. He taught them and together they worked on it, ways that they could collect rainwater in large, um, what, whatever you call them, not more than vats at any rate. He used their, tra their traditional knowledge to do this. And he was able to enable many villages to have enough rainwater for a year so that they weren't subject to doubts, droughts, and so that the women didn't have to walk miles a day as they traditionally did with heavy pottery jars on their head, bringing water back home, water that was often polluted. So this was huge for the villages. And he went on and do other things, to do other things. For example, he established something called the Barefoot College. The Barefoot College where everyone who attended, including, including the teachers, had no college degrees. They talked about their traditional knowledge and how to use it in India. So I think it's a beautiful story. And I told it in some detail because Clearly, here was an example of altruism, a man who was animated by a love that went beyond his own personal gain, a love for others for its own sake, the love that is fundamental to the fabric of what is, fundamental to the fabric of what is. And I'll say there's a sweet postscript to this story, and that is now the World Bank does support his projects. Local Indian governments are supporting his projects and his family has reconciled with him. So all, all, all these good things, but he did it anyway during all those years where he was alienated from his parents, where he was not being supported, he went ahead. And I find it so amazing and inspiring. What can be done? The power of love. So in this context, I would like to further illustrate this understanding that love, and I mean a universal love, is the fabric of what is. I want to illustrate it by sharing with you the teaching, Buddhist teaching, of Indra's net. 
Some of you heard it. I talked about it recently in the course that we're giving now that Phil is leading on Indian history. This comes from Theravada Buddhism, pardon me, Mahayana Buddhism. Indra's net. It's an image in a scripture called the flower ornaments, this flower ornament scripture, the Huayan's scripture. It, that's uh, Hua Yen, not Hawaiian, Hua Yen. It is Chinese. And it is, I learned about it when I was in Zen. It's not a Zen scripture, but the Zen master I initially studied with, it was Korean. He talked about it all the time. And so some of us got the sutta, the sutra, and I'll say it is huge. It's like 800 pages. Now I didn't read the whole thing because it could, it could stand up to any of the Theravadan scriptures in length, let me put it that way. But um, I did read the part about Indra's net. And I would like to tell you about what this teaching is. First of all, Indra. Indra was a Vedic deity. That is an ancient deity in India before, before Hinduism was established as Hinduism. This was ancient, deeply embedded in the, in, in the culture there. And Indra was considered the deity, the king of the heavens. So pretty powerful. Now, the scripture refers to the universe as Indra's net. According to, and this is an image, this is a metaphor. Indra's net is portrayed as this net that involves the entire universe. And in every juncture, at every node in the net, there is a jewel. And each jewel is precious and is different from every other jewel. And the light from every jewel is reflected onto every other jewel. So every one of them affects all the others. There are no separate, separate jewels. Each jewel and the net are just not only part of the universe, but are the universe itself. You might almost think of it like a hologram. The universe itself, because each part reflects the whole. So whatever one does is reflected in and affects all of them. And of course, this isn't the literal truth, but I will say this image, Indra's net, is a pre-glimpse a pre-glimpse of quantum physics. This idea in quantum physics where everything is possibility, where particles affect everything else instantaneously. I'm sure many of you have read that a particle in one place can affect another particle. Movement in one will affect another very, very far away. Albert Einstein called that spooky action at a distance. How does that happen? Can't be explained. So I thought, you know, Indra's, action, Indra's net is like total spooky action at a distance. Everything affects everything else. So the net and all the jewels refer to human, to beings, human beings and every other being, not just human beings. We are all interrelated. We all reflect and affect each other. And I want to read a quote by Judy Reutemann. She wrote an article in uh, Lion's Roar in January. And she said about Indra's net now she was talking about. She said, if we all lived with a consciousness of the underlying reality that Indra net points to, our world would look very different. Our world would look very different if we all lived with that fundamental understanding, that basic understanding that we're all related profoundly. And that's not just human beings. So Indra's net actually refers to Buddha nature. Everything is Indra's net and everything is Buddha's nature. 
and Buddha nature is love. Not love with a specific being object in mind. I love you and you, but just universal love. That's what it is about. So that's what we're connected by, our being. Indra's net is a way to describe universal love. Something that is always present, that we don't create, and that our practices of metta and compassion enable us to touch in to what is already there. We cultivate metta, we cultivate compassion and beautiful practices, but we're cultivating something that already exists. And we're touching more deeply and we're touching into it or hopefully recognizing that which already exists. Now, you know, I know that some people can hear this and might think, well, does it really make a difference? Here's one more piece of information in the Buddhist huge amount of information and teaching, Indra's net. I personally think this one is a really important teaching, Indra's net. Does it make a difference? Do we need to really think that it portrays underlying reality? I think it, 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 I, if we say no, that's fine. We can continue going on with our own practices and they're beautiful. But I think that it really helps to recognize, yes, this is underlying reality. It's not just some image that some ancients cooked up a long time ago in China because they wanted to sound lofty. That wasn't the point. What they were portraying in Indra's net was one, <clears throat> what's the heart of awakening? It's not everyone or every awakening experience is all of a sudden there's Indra's net. Nothing so literal as that. But what Indra's net reflects is what each one of us can experience in our own way. And that is the interconnectedness. Awakening is awakening to universal love. So I will say the Buddha did not use love, universal love. At least I've never found it in the scriptures. He talked about metta, loving friendliness or loving kindness. There's a difference. But he did use a lot of other, and I think that that word love as we use it these days, universal love, wasn't really part of the, at least not part of the ancient Buddhist tradition. But he's made, used many other words to describe it. And he called it the true among others. Here it is, the true, the beyond, the featureless, peace, the exquisite, bliss, the pure, and many, many other descriptors, love, love. So I think what Buddha was pointing to is the same thing that Indra's net portrays, love. In a little while, I'll offer a meditation. And I hope some of you will find that maybe somewhat illust illustrative of what we're talking about. I won't go into it now. But I would like to just say, this message is not new. It's not part of our <laughs> Theravadan teaching per se directly. It's just where the Buddha is pointing to. But We've all heard the poem by Rumi. I think for me, it's one of my favorite Rumi poems. We've heard it here because we've often quoted it here. I'll quote it again. He said, out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other, doesn't make any sense. He's talking about love, impersonal love. It's simply the very nature, the fundamental nature of the universe. <clears throat> Last week, Kyra Jolingo 
in her lovely talk, her beautiful talk, said the same thing and using different words. She urged us to let go of doubting thoughts and see the world as love and all beings as the beloved. That's Indra's net. That's Rumi's poem, The Universe. This is not just a belief. I'm trying to, I'm just not trying to say nice words. It's not something only oh, let's go ahead and think of all the world's love. It's better than thinking of all of the world is hate. This is what can be directly experienced. The Sufis have a practice. It's called zikr, spelled or transliterated it, Z-I-K-R. Zikr means remembrance. Theirs is a practice of remembering God, remembering God. And I would like to suggest remembering love is basically the same thing. We don't have to get caught up on the fact that we don't believe in God if we don't, and then put up a wall and say, uh-uh, not for me. Sicker is about remembrance, and that's what they've done. They remember God. So here I have talked about love from a tiny little spider to Indra's net, from a minute to the universal. How do we remember love once we glimpse it as universal love? We remember it as, I hope, as a belief, as an ideal. But I even hope even more that it is known or directly experienced as a truth. And how can we remember it once we directly experience it? Well, I think there are a few ways how to remember love, calling it into our lives. It's important, important to call into your life. I am suggesting love right now. But what your highest spiritual ideals are, call them into your life. I will tell you, I wish somebody had told me that before. It's not just for me, I have found, about meditating, not just about knuckling down and being mindful, important, but it is going back and resting most deeply, calling into my life, one's life, what is the highest ideal? Remembrance, how to do that. The Sufis do it, we can do it. Well, with love, you can take, for example, as a practice, remembering one being that you love deeply and then expanding beyond the personal and remembering it, practicing it, bringing it into your life multiple times a day. You're walking down the street, you're opening the door to your house, whatever, remember. It becomes quite literally a practice. Or if you have experienced it directly, go back to it. Don't expect it's just gonna come whenever it's gonna hit you again and be wonderful again. And it's an experience that comes and goes, bring it in make it part of your life. So the loving connection can be practiced. So my friends, that I suggest that I suggest is a practice that we can do. I hope that you will take it up and do the same. I guess the last thing I would like to say, okay, I've talked about love and maybe now you're kind of a little bit bored. Sounds like it's repetitious. Where do we go from here? We live it, that's it, by calling it into our life and then trying to express it in our actions. Whatever your actions are, everyone is called to different sorts of action, whether we're at home, at work, through the successes and the bright moments, the dark moments, whatever your actions. At IMCC, as you all know, 
we've been working for a long time with white awareness, diversity. We have a new group working on climate. One Earth Movement, eco -satvas. In all of this, I hope all of us could kind of bring love, not fear, not anger into our actions. And so the invitation is, I hope you will remember it and hopefully experience it directly. In a few moments, I'll lead a meditation that I hope maybe will put some experience behind these words. But right now, I want to thank you for listening and thank you for your practice. So I'll begin then with a guided meditation. And uh, this meditation is going to involve a lot of your imagination, envisioning. And we'll start in that way. So I'm going to invite you just to imagine that you are traveling to visit friends. They have a small place in a rural area by the ocean and you're driving there. And also imagine you, and it may not be too hard that you live in Charlottesville and you really haven't been out of town since before COVID. And you haven't seen your friends for even longer than that. I've been to the ocean. So you're eagerly looking forward to this visit. So imagining now, if you just close your eyes, sit back and come into a quiet place. And you're arriving you arrive at your friend's it's a bungalow late in the afternoon and they greet you warmly. You unpack, put your things in a very small guest room and then you share dinner with them. And after the dinner, after dinner, you sit on the porch with them. You're kind of looking out the trees, no people around. And you talk with your friends as the sun goes down and it gets dark. And then you say that you'd like to go down to the beach. And so they give you a blanket so you can put it down on the sand and you walk a short distance from the bungalow to the beach, you arrive, it's quiet there. There are no sounds except the gentle lapping of the waves on the shore. You're the only one there, no one else is on the beach. And it's a cloudless summer evening. You spread the blanket out on the sand. You lie down completely comfortable and you look up at the sky and you're stunned. It's been such a long time since you've seen the sky unpolluted by city lights. The moon isn't up yet. And the stars are glittering. Countless masses of stars. And at first you just gaze and gaze at the beauty that takes your breath away. It's been so long. And then you begin picking out constellations. Big Dipper, Orion. You see a shooting star that looks like it falls into the ocean. And you just lie there. 
And as you do, gradually, you stop noticing individual stars. You stop noticing constellations. And you even stop noticing the sky. Because gradually, all sense of sky and beach disappears. There seems to be no boundary where one begins and the other ends. Almost without noticing, you're drawn into this immensity, this fathomless immensity that has no beginning and no end. The problems and the issues that you brought with you, they fade, they recede. It's not so much that you make an effort to let go of anything. They simply drop away and you're being held in the immensity that is. And also fading away your plans, your disappointments, your successes and expectations, even your personal history, your family, your loved ones, your very identity, age, gender, education, for right now, they just drop away. The sound of the lapping waves on the shore, they also fade. So now being held, no boundary between the heavens, the ocean and yourself. Just immensity. Being held in this immensity, and so I'm asking you some questions, I'm inviting you just to answer silently, directly, not a lot of thought. Did this, what you're experiencing right now, did you create it? what you are experiencing, can it be lost? Does it have a shape? Does it exist in time, in space, like a table, for example, exists in space? Does it have an outside or an inside? What about conflicts? Are there any conflicts, contradictions within it? Any problems? Is there a boundary? Some place where it is and then some place where it is not. Is it far away from you or is it near? Can it become depressed or angry or sad?
What about a beginning and an end? Does it have a beginning and an end? Is there time? Is there time in this? Is this personal? And so I'll say that you're experiencing and what you experience now is that which is. It's the natural state. It's Buddha nature, your own being. It's what you are before you knew yourself as an individual. So I invite you to continue, if you wish, with this experience. And you may find that even if you wish to do it, it seems to proceed. Perhaps it was just a brief glance. Or maybe questions and doubts arise. Not a problem. A glimpse is enough. When distracting thoughts arise, simply let them fade. And when they fade, the immensity is there. You don't have to do anything but no effort, no effort is necessary here. In the remaining time for our meditation here, and we'll meditate for about 15 more minutes, do what is easy for you. If you prefer to continue with mindfulness practice, yes, fine your usual practice, or if you wish to drop into immensity, doing that too, in and out as you can. And I'll ring a bell about 15 minutes.
And now, before this meditation period ends, I want to read a blessing by John O'Donoghue. May my mind come alive today to the invisible geography that invites me to new frontiers, to break the dead shell of yesterdays, to risk being disturbed and changed. May I have the courage today to live the life that I would love, to postpone my dream no longer, but to do at last what I came here for and waste my heart on fear no more. So friends, this immensity that in imagination, I hope you were able to travel to, this is the love. That might sound surprising, but that's it. There's no separation in it. There's no conflict in it. It's utterly silent. You can call it love. I guess I'll say one more thing about it. You know what? You do not need to go to the beach in your mind. You don't need anybody to guide a meditation to go there. You can do it anytime, always, just by yourself. Silence. And if you want to imagine a beach, fine. The more you do it, the more you will naturally find your way there. Like that. So many blessings.